The World Health Organization is recommending in its strongest terms that a deeper investigation is needed to determine how the COVID-19 virus originated and if it was indeed accidentally leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. This comes after nearly two years of mainstream media marring the lab leak theory as a conspiracy. Reporter at U.S. Right to Know, Emily Kopp, joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Emily. Hey, great to be here. All right, so this does feel like a, a significant pivot. You know, I spoke a week or so ago to the, the man who is heading Lancet Medical Journal's investigation into this, and even people who, you know, like Jeffrey Sachs, who are, you know, more established, you know, you might call them establishment figures, are leading this cause here. So wh why the shift? What's going on right now? Yeah, this might seem like a total 180 um, if you haven't been paying close attention to this story. So just for background here, this is the Scientific Advisory Group for the Origins of Novel Pathogens. It's a new advisory group um, under the World Health Organization that Director General Tedros set up after that first mission to Wuhan um, came back with the conclusion that a lab origin was extremely unlikely. And Director General Tedros essentially said, we don't have enough evidence to rule it out yet. Um, and he sort of questioned the credibility of his own organization's report, which was remarkable. Um, so he set up this new advisory group. Um, and I think what is pretty refreshing here is that in a debate that has really been dominated by two global superpowers, right? China and the US, both with their own interest in taking attention away from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, we have this new group that pulls from experts from two dozen different countries. And it also pulls from expertise outside of virology because, you know, virologists have a lot of great knowledge and have a lot to bring to this debate. But, you know, let's get real. They have a bias towards the hypothesis that does not implicate the field of virology. So mm -hmm. what resulted is really a report that I think offers one of the most balanced view of the evidence that um, that we've got so far. And the reason for the 180 is really, um, I think a lot of circumstantial evidence has surfaced since, um, you know, the WHO's first report. And we also have gotten some new information on just how shallow and politically compromised that first um, you know, February 2021 report was. Tell us a little bit about this emerging evidence and tell us also a little bit about how it really casts some doubt on the evidence that we'd sort of formerly been been using and referencing to determine the veracity of this. Um, what new things have emerged, Emily? Sure, yeah, so there are, like I said, sort of two important elements here, right? So we learned in new detail just how politically compromised that first mission to Wuhan, China was. In what way? Um, so for, Do you mind going into some detail about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we learned essentially that the United States was asked to nominate a few people to serve as investigators. Um, and according to Brett Girard, who was um, part of the Trump administration's pandemic response, he testified to Congress that the U.S. had nominated career bureaucratic you know, scientists from FDA, CDC, and NIH. Instead, who is put on this mission, but um, Peter Daszak, who is the president of the Eco Health Alliance, which is this controversial nonprofit that sort of serves as an intermediary between the NIH and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So that's a significant conflict of interest, right? And there are real questions about what went on behind the scenes that led him to be, you know, the US delegate there. Um, you know, and we also learned from Peter Ben Embarek, who was the chair of this earlier mission, that um, essentially the only way that they could get the lab hypothesis into the final report was by saying it was extremely unlikely. The choice that Chinese authorities presented the team with apparently was either don't mention it at all or say it was extremely unlikely. Uh, that is uh, what he told um, a Danish documentary. He has since said that that was mistranslated, but hasn't offered many further details. But it certainly cast doubt on, on the report. You would almost think that these sort of um, potentially in bed with Trump, uh, possibly hackish partisans 
would be uh, more interested in spreading a, a Chinese lab leak theory than as opposed to less. Uh, what do you make of that sort of odd, um, you know, not, not exactly inconsistency, but that's like a funny wrinkle that sort of doesn't comport with how I think that would go. What do you make of that? So the politics around this in, uh, around this issue are um, quite interesting and um, quite complex. I think I think um, Republicans have been more consistent, um, certainly than Democrats, in pushing for an investigation into the possibility that um, you know the Wuhan Institute of Virology could have experienced the lab accident that ignited the pandemic. Um, the complexity comes from the fact that the National Institutes of Health was funding um, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, um, you know, rank and file Republicans in the House are pretty interested in looking at this because, you know, Anthony Fauci has become, um, you know, a, a uh, figure on the right that gets a lot of scorn. And so that is politically um an advantage for them. But there are, you know, plenty of people, I think, sort of in the rank and file um, in the US government who would prefer to not dig deeper here. Um, and that's been out by a lot of great investigative reporting. So, well, we're two years out from this now. And I've heard some people say that this is all well and good, that they want to start doing comprehensive, substantive investigations now. But it's a little late in a lot of the evidence that might have been collected that pointed one way or the other about the origins of COVID-19 might be long gone. Can you give us a sense of what the expectations are about what this kind of new investigation is going to be like and what kind of fruit they expect it to bear? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, so this group is not dedicated to conclusively identifying the origins of COVID. It's sort of meant to lay out a roadmap of future studies. But mm. as you said, you know, a lot of the data has been lost. However, you can still do retrospective studies um, on, you know, serology. So testing the blood, say, of wildlife farmers and seeing if that might have been a route. Um, there are also scientists working really hard to find new um, genetic data. So helping to fill out the phylogenetic tree and discover more about how the virus evolved. And of course, you know, us at <laughs> US Right to Know are digging into what sort of gain of function research might have been going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, that could have made a bat coronavirus more um, apt to infect humans and cause a pandemic. Um, so there's still a lot that we can dig into here. I think what's really sort of tragic is that um, Chinese scientists have been cultivating expertise in SARS-like viruses for almost 20 years now, and they are certainly best positioned to do these sort of studies. But unfortunately, because of political considerations in that country, um, they are not able to do that work. And um, that's definitely more not in their Yeah, it's really despicable how, I mean, we have excellent Chinese scientists um, you know, doing, like you said, really impressive work in this field of virology, and yet the, the CCP is really hindering the degree to which we can actually rely on data that's coming from there and really styming a lot of this, which I think, I think erodes uh, the, the scientists' credibility and really takes away from their accomplishments. It's like such a clear and obvious example to me of authoritarian state power, uh, you know, really impeding uh, the incredible work of people on the ground. Um, who in many cases are not corrupt scientists and they're not in bed with the CCP and absolutely want to be doing the right thing. And yet, you know, it's really, really hard for us to even investigate this because of, you know, Chinese authoritarianism and the degree to which people are really stymieing the free flow of information to the U.S. Yeah, and I think another interesting part of the report that came out last week is that Director General Tedros wrote two letters to China asking for updates on the science that had conducted since the first report. And they were not addressed to the head of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, they were not addressed to the head of the Chinese CDC. It was to politicians. Um, so it seems clear to me that they are the um, barrier here. And Emily, am I right to, to have been told uh, to understand that there's also been a lot of um, you know, barriers, a lot of hesitancy from American labs that have been doing this research in concert with the, the Wuhan labs from releasing data on what exactly they were doing stateside as well. 
Certainly, yes. Um, we we shouldn't only criticize, um, you know, obstruction by Chinese authorities. The NIH has been less than forthcoming about um, genomic data that could help fill out this story, and they've been less than transparent about those grant reports, um, you know, that could help us better understand what sort of research EcoHealth Alliance was um, funding, you know, via NIH uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, so. So yeah, let's be equal in our, our criticism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, though it is good news that we don't have like a great firewall or, you know, CCP tyrants preventing the, the spread of information. But absolutely, I mean, more accountability and transparency as much as possible is the ideal. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Emily. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll have more rising after this.